Uh, and on that note, um, I'd like to uh, say a few words about our next speaker, Nathan Narusis. Nathan was with that uh, original group uh, back in uh, Zambate uh, when um, Professor Fekete was launching his Gold Standard University Live. And uh, that group has been rather core and loyal since that time. And uh, Nathan, uh, has, he's an invet uh, basically on the investment side of banking, but uh, has a deep, deep interest in, uh, in the theoretical foundation of uh, gold, money, and uh, what is happening today. And, uh, that's, uh, so this topic is, is going to be on that issue of backwardation, uh, what it means and the implications uh, uh, for the economy and uh, gold prices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to give a warm welcome to Nathan Narusis. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think it was a uh, scientist at the Xerox company that said the, uh, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, I like to think that that scientist was uh, referring to more than simply coming up with the next best piece of technology that will capture a certain segment of the technology market. I like to think that he meant it in a broader sense, that if you see uh, how the future ought to unfold, not because you want it to or because you think you've done the math right and you want to uh, uh, bet on it, but because you think it ought to unfold that way because it's good and right and proper that it should, then you should speed up and try and influence the way that future is going to unfold. And I think that sort of sentiment definitely applies to what's been going on here for the last few days. Now, I have the enjoyable job this morning of uh, coloring in the outlines that uh, the greater minds than mine have uh, been sketching here. Uh, I'm going to do a bit of uh, extrapolation and uh, maybe some exploration of the theories that you've read about and seen here uh, with the goal of trying to bring um, uh, application to investment decisions to what we have been hearing about. So a quick overview, I'm going to uh, provide, uh, I like to call it sort of an alternate chain of reasoning for uh, some of the arguments uh, the professor has made about uh, aggradation and its effect on the global economy and on the debt structure. And uh, that's helped me understand it better and understand its applications to investments better. And uh, for those of you who uh, are still uh, grappling with it, uh, maybe it will help you as well. And for those who have already an understanding of it, maybe it will strengthen your understanding. Uh, for those of you who were here last year, uh, I'll be building a little bit on what I talked about in terms of asset class valuation, but uh, for those of you who are new, I'm giving enough context that you won't be left behind. Now, I'm, uh, I'm going to ask you to hold questions until the end. I'm only going to speak for about 25 minutes or so, so there will be plenty of time for questions and I'll be glad to go back and uh, elaborate on anything that I've said. So I'll start with... Uh, the idea about uh, uh, the gold coin being the only proper way to extinguish debt. Now that's, on the surface, you can do some math pretty quickly and see why that might be the case. Uh, if, we have, uh, if we have the gold, uh, the total stock of gold in the world growing by its annual production of somewhere between 1 and 2% a year, and we have the average rate on debt at somewhere between 4 and 5%, I'm just guessing for the debt rate, but I think that's uh, reasonable. And you can see very quickly that uh, ultimately the ability to carry that debt, uh, if, it's, if it's just fiat currency, is going to swamp the ability for it to ever be repaid. So you've got the seeds of its destruction sown right there. And that's even including the fact that some of these debtors will uh, go bankrupt, because as we've seen, it's always the small guys who have to declare bankruptcy. The large, uh, large entities generally get bailed out. But let's go deeper than that, uh, because I want to uh, see if I can uh, establish the exact steps by which that takes place. But before we do, I think that uh, a useful analogy for people thinking about our current economy is, uh, is this, if, if we, just, uh, we just look at it this way. Right now, the gold coins are still trading. They're not circulating as currency, but gold is still being traded as an investment. I think it's as though, uh, uh, if you can think of the economy, uh, or, or just think of it as an analogy, that it, 
If this room held more people than it has this morning, let's say it had 200 or 300 people standing here, and it was completely sealed, and there was no air getting in, and we couldn't get out, <laughs> if, uh, if, if you had a small uh, window open just a crack far off in the corner, then that would slow down the rate at which we were all dying of uh, carbon dioxide poisoning. And that's a kind of a, uh, a grim analogy. But I, think, uh, I think it applies to what we're, what we're talking about here. Now, you know, if you if you have the you know the necessary science and measuring equipment, you can say, well, the human beings in the room are producing this much carbon dioxide, and there's this much fresh air getting in, and therefore, you know, they'll have 12 hours instead of you know two hours if everything is sealed. Something like that. Now, it's not. A, I don't want to carry the analogy too far because um, carbon monoxide, uh, carbon dioxide, is a natural byproduct of life, whereas fiat currency uh, is not. So I don't want to use it as a. I don't want to use it any further than that. But I think that that is perhaps the best way to describe what we're facing now. Gold is still being traded, and debt is being cleared and, and ultimately uh, uh, extinguished. And I think that small bit of sort of fresh air leaking into the system is what's keeping us going for now. So, uh, as I said, we, we can see that there's a slow march towards uh, debt collapse, uh, and we want to know what makes it, uh, what will make it into a sprint. Now, before I get into the meat of my remarks, uh, I'm just going to make a, a brief passing comment on investment analysis because uh, I've run into a lot of it in my uh, career in the industry, and I can see that uh, and, you know this won't be news to a lot of you, but it just simply it falls into uh, three different categories. You have fundamental analysis, uh, where you're simply looking at the, the known facts about the company's history. Warren Buffett loves to do this. You do your analysis. You pay a fair price, or even better than fair price, uh, cheaper than fair if you can manage it, and wait, and ultimately you'll be proven right. And of course it's worked for Buffett, it's worked for many value investors over time. The opposite, or maybe not the opposite, but certainly a completely different approach is taken by the technical analysts, where they simply say, just give me price and volume data, and I don't care about anything else, and I will take that data and process it and determine what's going to happen next. Now, neither one of these two, I think, will give you um, a, a proper uh, short-run prediction when it comes to gold, or the price of, the, I should say, uh, the value of the dollar relative to gold. But the third one, I think, will, and it will also help us answer the questions uh, that I'm dealing with this morning, the effect of permanent backwardation on the economy and the effect of uh, 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 permanent backwardation on the debt structure. And that third one, I could call it maybe aggressive uh, trading or anticipatory trading, where you do try and collect all of the short-term, uh, or, or rather all of the, um, uh, the uh, immediate factors pressing on the value of an investment, and process that and come up with an answer. Now, to give that some uh, content, what I mean by that is if you were looking at an individual mining stock, for example, you would be looking at uh, things like when are its warrants expiring, I'm talking the junior miners here, of course, when are the warrants expiring from its last financing, uh, is a new financing expected? Uh, when, when are the drill results out? Uh, when is the tax loss season, uh, the tax loss selling season? How far away is that from today? Uh, and of course, what are the trading habits of the big players in this space? And you can learn all of those things, and it allows you to do a better job of trading individual stocks. Well, by comparison with the uh, trying to figure out the dollar gold uh, valuation, we would look at things like is the IMF going to be selling more? Uh, is China buying more? Uh, are there shortages in the coin stores? Uh, what are the trading habits of the main players? Which we have learned about, especially with the professor's comments about the, uh, the, bear, uh, the uh, bull in bear's skin. Well, as I said, please keep that in mind during the rest of my talk, because I think that when we apply this third method of analyzing it, we can uh, find better, uh, better answers. So, when we're dealing with a complex problem, like the effect of uh, permanent backwardation on the economy and on the bond uh, the debt structure, I think it's useful to back up and take a moment to see that we can be sure that uh, we know what we think we know. Look at it by other means. And so I'm going to provide an alternate chain of reasoning here. First off, what is, what is debt? Remind, let's remind ourselves for a moment of the actual definition of debt. It's a, a dollar obligation to pay interest and principal by a certain date. And failing that, often there's a claim on the assets of the debtor, either a specific claim on specific assets, or a general claim on all the debtor's assets. Well, people may be wondering, so what 
if gold goes into current backwardation, most of the world doesn't care. The fiat dollars all still exist. They're all still in our wallets, and the bank machines are waiting to dispense them. The computer systems that have recorded the bank balances are all still intact. Why can't we just carry on with a fiat system even if nobody wants to sell gold anymore? Well, here is what I uh, like to call the actual transmission mechanism that will bring this withdrawal of all gold for sale into the, the consciousness of the world and have its effect. I think, I can't find the source for this investment quote, but I think it's uh, been uh, made by a few uh, investment commentators. Prices, in the short run of course, prices are set at the margins by the smartest of the investors. Now, I think the first part of that statement is fairly uncontroversial. In Vancouver, uh, it's probably uh, similar for most major cities, but in Vancouver, only about 4% of the residential houses turn over and change hands in any given year. So what does that mean? It means for 96% of the homeowners, regardless of what they think their house is worth or ought to be worth, they're not voting. The only people voting are the people who are actually selling or buying a house. Now the second part of that uh, contention, the smartest investors are the ones setting the prices, especially when we are at extremes of prices. I think that can be demonstrated too. I don't think it's uh, controversial to claim that active traders who are successful do have greater intelligence than buy and hold investors. It's not a knock against buy and hold investors, they just know their limitations. Active traders are able to crunch the uh, data coming in, qualitative and quantitative, and make the right decisions. It's difficult. It's difficult psychologically to trade actively. So I think it's safe to say that on one half of every transaction, uh, there is a, an above average uh, intelligence investor. Now both parties to the transaction may be above average intelligence, <coughs> but then they're reaching a very uh, fair price. But I think you've always got at least uh, one that has superior knowledge. And uh, you can see this especially when the markets get to extremes. If there is a bubble, an apparent bubble in uh, uh, stock prices, but the smartest minds <coughs> believe it's going to go higher, well they've got the, the cash in hand and the availability of financing to chase something higher, to whatever price they think proper. If it's a, a, a stress market and sellers are desperate to get rid of their assets, well, same thing, the smartest investors don't need to buy. They have the patience to wait for either stability or what they think a fair price is. And if it turns out that they don't get their uh, order filled, it doesn't matter to them. They have enough money that uh, it's not going to not going to make a difference to their lifestyle. Now, what uh, you may be wondering, what, how do I tie that in to gold backwardation and its effect on the economy? Well, the coming of permanent backwardation in gold is a huge signal to these smartest investors. It's a signal that the rules of the game are about to change for all asset classes. Now, this ties into a bit of what I was saying last year here. If we go back, uh, really this is a reapplication, it's not new rules, it's a reapplication of the old rules. Rules that existed 100 years ago, when before the Federal Reserve was formed in the United States. Uh, rules that existed 100 years ago and whose uh, echoes could still be seen even 30 years ago, even as recently as 30 years ago, before the, uh, the interest rate uh, structure uh, started moving down. And that is that there were natural proper earnings multiples, proper yields for the various investment classes. And this can be determined by reference to the data that's available. Now I relied on the CFA Institute's uh, brightest minds in their research papers to, uh, to take my uh, math from. Now they were not uh, pursuing the same uh, research with regards to gold, but uh, I, I trust that they did a thorough job of getting the uh, data together. It's not complete like it is today, but it's, it's uh, substantial. And uh, what that data showed is that 100 years ago, the earnings multiple for the broad stock market uh, as a whole was about 13 and a half times. In other words, the reciprocal of that, 7%, a 7% earnings yield. Now I like to use the phrase earnings yield. Uh, I think Buffett, uh, Warren Buffett was the first person I saw use that. It sort of uh, makes sense if you're buying companies uh, uh, whole like he does uh, more often than simply buying stock. But it's, it's applicable to any size of uh, stock investor. 
That's not the dividend yield, of course, that's the entire earnings of the company available to the owner. And that's about what the situation was 100 years ago. Well, something happened since then, and the CFA, uh, the brightest minds at the CFA Institute have written a lot and thought a lot and tried to figure out the puzzle. And this is not meant as a, 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 any disrespect to them. I think they're both, uh, they're both very intelligent and their hearts are in the right place. I think they're you know, honestly trying to figure out what's going on because it's alarming to them that today we have earnings multiples of, uh, and by the way, I'm talking here trailing 12 month uh, gap earnings, not operating earnings, uh, even the gap earnings, uh, you know, especially in light of what the professor was saying yesterday, even the gap earnings are uh, probably too optimistic if they're not properly uh, appreciating the capital. But uh, uh, when, you, when you see today that earnings multiples are 20, 30, 40, I think the current uh, earnings multiple for the index is north of 50, uh, based on the 12-month trailing uh, earnings. I haven't seen the latest, but uh, it's an enormous change. And the CFA Institute uh, 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 scholars were wondering, why is this so? Well, for students of gold like us, I don't think it's a big mystery. Uh, in fact, I think it's actually, a, 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 in a way, it's an application of the first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy. If you have, after 1971, a massive expansion of the fiat currency in circulation, well, that's going to have an effect. It's, it's not only going to transfer wealth from uh, the poor and middle class to the banking elite and their connected friends, but it's also going to have an effect as the, uh, the largest uh, or the, the main asset classes are accumulated by these wealthy elite, real estate and uh, stocks. You are going to have, simply by the fact of um, the, the uh, buying pressure over the years, pushing these earnings multiples up and, and no shortage of buying pressure coming behind that to hold them up, uh, you're going to have much, much higher levels for uh, these asset classes. Under a fiat currency system, you take away that, that fiat currency where uh, now people have to go back to valuing something uh, how it used to be under a gold standard, and I think you're going to see a return to uh, the equilibrium value of that, the lower shoot of the downside, I think, but we'll get a return much, much lower. Now, real estate, uh, by the way, my, my uh, rough calculations based on the, uh, on the CFA's, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Institute's research, is that real estate globally, on average, is probably about two times as expensive as it ought to be. Stocks about three times, roughly. Mm -hmm. Now, notice that uh, when the wealthy get <coughs> this uh, excess wealth from the, from the fiat, you know, the, the spoils of the fiat banking system, they're spending it on uh, more real estate and more stocks. They're, they're simply tucking their wealth away. Uh, the poor certainly don't get you know, increased ability to pay rent, and that's why you have this earnings multiple rise for real estate. Uh, they don't get increased ability to purchase consumer goods. That's why you don't get the profits for the corporations rising. And instead you get this strange effect of uh, <coughs> horrible yields for, uh, for equity investments. Now, uh, the, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit, of course. It's not a closed system like this because you do have, you know, when I, when I said conservation of energy, the, the, you know, the, the effect has to be seen somewhere else besides simply wealth transfer, it's not a completely closed system because wealth is being created, so there's not a fixed amount of wealth in the world. But less and less wealth is being created each year in the fiat system, proportionally. Now, that brings us to, so that's, I think, a, you know, a, 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 a snapshot of the effect on the economy. But let's talk about the effect on the debt structure. Because bonds are a special kind of creature. In a way, they're sort of a subset of real estate or a subset of, uh, of equities because that's typically, uh, you know, it's either a mortgage or it's a claim against the assets of a corporation. Well, what happens if you have a situation where before gold could be exchanged in U.S. dollars and buy anything in the world? And now you have a situation uh, after, um, uh, after 1971 where the U.S. dollar is at the top of the system. And yes, you can flow it through gold if you want, but you can go directly to world trade with it. Well, what's happened when we have primitive accreditation is that suddenly the U.S. dollar, and I think this isn't a, you know, a, I think it's a fair statement to make that the U.S. dollar right now is, at, at this moment, is superior to gold in terms of use as a, uh, as a money because it's just by basis of its wider acceptance. 
you will get further anywhere in the world on average with US dollars than you will with gold coins. However, uh, I also think it's without question that gold is definitely a number two place to be a very close second. If we suddenly have now an inability to convert the US dollar to gold, now the question goes up around the world, well, if this medium which we thought was the best in the world is no longer acceptable for trade, uh, for exchange into the second best medium, now I'd rather have the second, let's, let's, go to the, uh, let's go to the backup because there's no doubt whatsoever that it will be accepted everywhere. So what does this mean for bonds? Well, I think it's a very, very chaotic situation. One of two things would happen. I can just imagine the, uh, the lawyers for each side fighting about it. The creditors, or rather the, uh, the debtors, uh, sorry, sorry, the creditors, the creditors will be looking at the situation saying, well, you know, uh, you can't honor the terms of the agreement anymore because we'll be, we'll be wiped out. You know, if you try and pay us back with paper dollars or with, with bank balances, you know, checks drawn on, uh, on fiat dollar balances in the banks, You've, you've subverted the whole spirit of this contract. We're now completely wiped out and the equity holders are, you know, <coughs> un unmolested. Well, I can, uh, I can imagine lawyers for the debtors uh, saying, well, here's the contract right here. It says U.S. dollars. These are U.S. dollars. We've, we've extinguished our liability with you. Now, uh, it's almost a bit of a, a, a moot point because, uh, you know, in that kind of circumstance, I think it's pretty, uh, pretty clear that a bank holiday would follow very quickly after uh, uh, full liquidation, so there wouldn't be anybody writing checks on anything. But if the government did somehow keep the banks open, that's the crisis that would hit. And even if, even if the highest court immediately resolved it, you'd still have uh, massive chaos in the system as you tried to uh, dismantle the debt structure and determine what was a fair share of, of, uh, of the company and how you would do it with real estate, I'm not sure share a title or something, but the, it would be a big mess. But that is why this small little activity that 98% of people don't care about, uh, people refusing to trade gold, uh, has an effect that bleeds into the economy and into the debt market uh, very, very quickly. Now, uh, of course, uh, uh, this, uh, this assumes uh, that uh, you know, the, the, the fiat currency immediately becomes worthless. That would apply for 99.9% .9 of the countries in the world. There is one country that could actually step in at this juncture and keep its debt structure uh, intact if it so chose. Uh, I'm curious, can anybody guess which country that is? At least there's only one last time I checked. Does anyone have any idea which country has enough gold to back its currency? Norway. Sorry, say that again? Norway. Uh, not, not to my knowledge. Possibly. In the English channel? No. Uh, not anymore, either, I don't think. I think they sold enough of theirs. The only country that I know that has enough to do this is Venezuela. And uh, from what I know of... Uh, what I know of... Uh, Hugo! Hugo Chavez, uh, I don't think that he's a champion of the uh, rule of law, so I don't expect that that happen. But I mean, I don't mean to... I'm saying this for the sake of completeness. I don't mean to gloss over the fact that it's also assuming that fiat currency becomes uh, worthless. Now, when I talk about the other asset classes uh, reverting to a proper earnings multiple, of course, the other big assumption that I'm making, and I mean, it, nobody's really said it, it's such a depressing thing to consider, but the other big assumption that I'm making is that when it gets to this point, and all offers to sell gold are withdrawn, we are all hoping that the government will finally admit defeat, the United States government to begin with, and the other major governments of the world, and admit that gold, uh, you know, maybe try and back their currency by gold to some extent or figure out some way to unwind the system. <coughs> Certainly, as long as they don't stand in the way of gold and silver returning to use as money, then we can uh, count on this, uh, this reversion happening fairly quickly. If they do stand in the way of it, we won't have much time to get out of the way. Uh, then we will be facing, uh, you know, a complete anarchy. I mean, the, the electricity and the, and the water will stay on, but, you know, cities need, <laughs> they need gasoline, they need food. Uh, there'd be, well, let's just say, uh, when the exodus of the cities, I mean, let's just say that uh, Mad Max Road Warrior would be a pretty good breaking zone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, enough, uh, enough cheap uh, laughs here. The final things that I, uh, the final things that I wanted to uh, discuss, uh, I'll just say a few words about uh, my own uh, thoughts on the trigger points. I mean, it's, it's been said, but I think there's different, different ways of looking at it. Uh, coming back to uh, what I was saying about the uh, prices being set in the short run by the, by the at the margin by the smartest investors, 
What will trigger the removal of gold? Well, the smartest investors in gold are constantly measuring the ability of the central banks and the governments to keep the paper game going. Uh, every time backwardation threatens, it's a pretty good sign that a lot of those sophisticated large gold traders are saying, well, I think they've had this time. They don't, you know, I mean, now, you know, it's hard, it's, it's difficult, uh, it's a qualitative assessment. It's difficult to calculate when this might be, but you're seeing evidence of it every time you see a little whiff of backwardation. Uh, and of course, if this mentality were to take hold, it can only be fought by dumping real physical gold into the market for these gold traders to take possession of. Because they're not like 98% of the people that are satisfied with you know, some form of paper gold, if they're even interested in gold at all. These guys know the deal. They want the real thing. And they, you know, it will be SOS. It will be you know, position, uh, possession outside the system. Now, we also know for a fact that the, the value of the fiat assets that would be, uh, the dollar value of the fiat, as, fiat currency assets that would be, uh, I said that wrong, the fiat currency dollar value of the assets that would be seeking shelter, of course, dwarfs any amount of gold uh, that might be in the central bank's vault still and in any sort of dark pool, dark matter, uh, uh, <laughs> dark, dark investment pools uh, out there. Uh, and so we can see the end would come fairly quickly in that kind of circumstance. Now, why has this not yet happened? Well, uh, you know, one of the things I liked about the professor's works when I first started reading them was his uh, constant, or maybe not constant, but his regular uh, uh, check-in with the morality of the situation. Now, it's easy to say that the morality uh, of, you know, we, we can, it's easy to judge the morality of what the banks and the politicians have done with their unholy alliance for, uh, for going back, uh, you know, centuries. But the, the, you know, the, the private speculator, the sophisticated private speculator, can get in on the game too. And he has a doing so. And uh, I think the professor was right to not condemn him because, uh, as a famous philosopher once said, I think the, you know, the exact expression was, morality ends when the point of a gun begins. We didn't make the world the way it is. There's no other planet that we can move to. If we want to climb from you know, middle class or lower class up into a higher class, we have to work within the rules of the system given us. And some of these smart speculators have figured it out. And even keeping their books in gold ounces, as the professor you know, suggests that all the smart people do and should do, if they're able to see year after year 10 or 15 percent gain of their net worth as measured in gold ounces, why on earth would those speculators want to pull the plug on the system? So in a way, they're not uh, unwitting uh, supporters of the regime, but they're, I guess, maybe incidental supporters would be the right word. And I don't condemn them uh, uh, morally for it either. Well, I guess the last question is, uh, how long can this game go on? And to my mind, I see a couple of constraints. Uh, the first one we've talked about a lot, how much actual physical gold is still in the central bank's hands for use to manipulate the market. But the second one, the second constraint that I see is uh, if I were in the shoes of these banks playing their game, then really the, the goal would be to accumulate as much physical gold in my own private hands mm -hmm. and accumulate as much real estate and equity holdings in the you know, major corporations of the world. So unfortunately, this is kind of a depressing uh, 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 image too, but the constraint is how much independent wealth is left in the world. The banks, of course, can't get all the gold because they can't see where it's all buried, but they can certainly see where all the real estate in the world is. They can see where all the corporations are traded. Uh, the constraint, now, you know, if, if, if this constraint is the one that stops us rather than a shortage of physical bullion, then unfortunately we'll, wake, we'll uh, all wake up the next morning uh, as, as new feudal serfs of the, uh, the bankers. And and this applies even to billionaires, uh, potentially, because if they're not politically connected, it's no good. Just ask uh, some of Vladimir Putin's uh, ex-oligarchs there who thought they had it made, and then one day they woke up penniless in a Moscow jail cell. Now, I'd like to uh, end on a positive note. Some of you who were here last year, or, or some of you watching, uh, listening today, uh, may have realized the implication of, of, the, of the, you know, the theories that I'm trying to develop myself here. Uh, really, uh, I think the most powerful implication, with the most widespread application, is uh, you know it's very difficult to do financial planning today. And unfortunately, what you get from most financial planners is, well, you have this much in stocks, and we plug in eight percent. Well. Stocks are generally done 8% over the long run, and zip, 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 and there, you know, your retirement is secure, you've retired in five years and have, you know, enough income. 
And the smarter people, you know, have questions about that and wonder, well, how do we know? When you realize that there are natural uh, uh, earnings multiples and natural earnings yields for the major asset classes, and you know their proportions, uh, you can actually make a guess not only about what those asset classes should yield in a proper free world with real bills uh, clearing trade, you can also make an estimate for the proper purchasing power of an ounce of gold. Now here I'm not talking about the fact that you know it's remained stable since Roman times and it still buys a, a, a good suit. Because what's happened in the world, especially in the last 30 years with the uh, you know, with the, with the uh, asset classes getting so out of whack. That has no precedent in all of recorded history. Uh, you know, certainly not on a global scale. And that will have, you know, I'm not sure that that's another uh, manifestation of the first law of ther thermodynamics, but uh, that will have an impact on how uh, much that gold coin is worth in, in terms of relative purchasing power. And once you know that, then you have the entire puzzle, because then you will know the answer to the question, exactly how big does my net worth have to be as measured in gold ounces to assure the retirement income that I want in perpetuity. And that, uh, I guess, is a bit of a teaser. I am still, I do not have the figures refined carefully enough to give you a, a snap answer to that. But that's a bit of a teaser maybe for next year if, I, uh, if I'm able to uh, do the calculations. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll now take any questions. For Nathan, can you open the door? I need some fresh air. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, thanks very much for the presentation. Fascinating stuff. But <clears throat> what you've presented there is a situation that unfolds from a fiat system into a uh, anarchy or a gold-based system. Yes. And uh, in, my, in my view, there's a, another possible alternative. The, the powers that uh, run the, 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 the global finance system as we know it today aren't going to easily let this golden goose die. I agree. And one easy way to uh, make sure it doesn't is to simply change the deck chairs around in the next few years and introduce several euro type zones with, with, uh, with, with currencies that encompass several countries, do a debt transfer between the countries as, all, as they all have debt and uh, a bit of a uh, bit of paper juggling and a couple of international agreements and bingo, we're into a new international fiat currency system. Right. Well, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, you? And uh, I yeah. just, just wonder if it's about your comments on that. Yes, uh, certainly that's a possibility. What I can say, I don't think it's the most likely outcome. What I can say about that, which will maybe be of comfort to gold and silver investors, is that I don't think you can have such a major tectonic shift without a massive jump in the value of gold void. In other words, that's sort of like setting a, hitting a reset button. I'm going to use an overused cliche lately. Uh, because notice what happened in 1971, or not in 71, but fairly quickly after that, during the decade after that. Gold sort of caught up to where it should have been because of the debasement of the dollar to date. Uh, I think that if the governments of the world tried to do that, now I can't, I can't walk through the logic of that. All I can say is I think that there's a reason that it's happened in history, and uh, and I think that you know those those forces, however you want to describe them, you know the, the true economic forces asserting themselves, they will make so whatever this new cur block block of uh, different uh, block currencies or a new global currency might be, I think that its exchange rate into gold will see gold investors rewarded, perhaps quite a bit more so than under the scenario I laid out here, where fiat currency simply dies. Because, you know, uh, uh, I think the, 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 the actual math from the 70s was you had a, you know, after gold stabilized at around 400 or whatever, after the, you know, nine years of, or 10 years of, of run-up, and, uh, you know, you had basically a, a 10 or 12 times increase in purchasing power, offset by you know, uh, uh, you know, inflation uh, growing prices by about six, but you ended up with you know a very, very healthy uh, you know six times uh, increase in uh, in the purchasing power of gold. Uh, by the way, you know, I I think that's much greater than what you would get the purchasing power in gold uh, if the entire fiat system closed down tomorrow. Uh, so I guess that's not maybe a, an answer to your question, but I guess it's a uh, you know. I, I, the answer that I would give is, well, I'll take that as an investor. I mean, you know, I, uh, I enjoy accumulating wealth as much as the next guy. You're basically saying that 
that action of having regional characters and so forth, whatever the plan is and the action of it, doesn't come with consequences. And the consequences are that you're saying that the purchasing power goal could actually rise further because of that, that action. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. But yeah, this, I'm just presenting that as a oh, yeah, an alternate, another yeah. possibility as far yes. as. I, yes, I certainly agree with that. It is a, a possibility. I don't think it's as likely as a complete collapse of the system because I think that, uh, you know, I think we're overestimating the ability of even, you know, these smart uh, uh, people that may be pulling the strings here. I think we're overestimating even their ability to manage things. Uh, but it certainly is a, a possibility. Uh, Louis? I think that's a definite possibility just looking at the behavior of the central banks uh, lately. Um, and the most interesting, the latest development is the Bank of, uh, Central Bank of India buying 200 tons. There's an interesting, uh, I don't know if how many of you have read it already because you're all pretty switched on, um, but um, the, there's a story going on that the, the deal was made between the IMF, well, the US, um, and, and India for India to buy the gold because they didn't want China to buy it, because China produces it, and they're hoarding it. And so India can't produce any, and so to balance things out. So if you take that logic f further, really the powers today are meeting quietly behind the scenes, planning the next uh, monetary system, but they're positioning themselves so that they're all happy with it, hopefully, or as much as possible, maybe not all of them, but. You know, and India was going to be a big loser, and now they're going to be less of a loser. And uh, you know, so uh, I think it's more than likely that they're all positioning themselves with a new monetary system eventually. And Robert Fisk wrote a fascinating article about that. It seems like the date where that happens is 2018, uh, according to his sources. But they have all this time to get ready for it. And and the logical consequence is, if that's true, then of course. Why else would they want to afford more and more gold unless gold is going to be worth a lot more? Yes. Yeah, a slightly devil's advocate position, but sure. I, I listened a, a short while ago to Paul Van Eden. I don't know if people are generally familiar with Paul Van Eden. I, I, yeah, I've read that. Yeah, he, he seems to be quite a switched on investor. He's very much into gold and gold stock. And he's always been a strong supporter of uh, the kind of sentiments we've been listening to. However, he does sums to try to get to your last point, the fair value of gold, fair market value of gold. And just lately, the last thing I read was that he was selling quite a bit because he does his best estimates of the money printing that's going on. And I know they're not publish them free, but he has these proxies and he gets to it. And he had around $785 an ounce at a time when it was around $1,000 an ounce. So it's just a slight worry that a guy who has spent the best part of his adult life uh, working on these issues would say, I'm selling now, fair market value is 785. Oh, when we all feel something, I think we feel gut level. It's different. It's higher. <laughs> well, um, let's I, buy. The weak hands are strong things. Yeah, I guess uh, I guess I'd just like to be sure. I, I guess uh, I think that the error that, you know, respectfully, I think the error that he's making is uh, assuming that there will be some kind of orderly uh, wind down of. of you know, paper being exchanged for gold and or, or being officially backed by it. And it may be nothing of the case. I mean, if the US government got into a situation where they were absolutely up against the wall and nobody would accept anything but gold, then they may well, uh, you know, set a gold price that allows them to conserve much of their gold in Fort Knox, you know, however much they have left there, if it's, uh, if it's, if it's yes, if they have any. Um, and so I guess, you know, I, I, I certainly, I used to, I guess I used to look at that myself as a way to potentially value it, but now I, I've come to think it's, it's much more, not complex, but it's sort of much, a, a much greater fundamental shift because if nobody wants paper dollars at all, then it doesn't mean an infinite gold price. It means that paper dollars just, you know, they just become collector's items, you know, if, if that, or fire, you know, fire would, uh, you know, fire starters. And we, it's as though they, you know, just whisked away, you know, one night and, and we now have gold. And so it becomes how much gold is there relative, you know, the other assets of the world don't vanish. The corporations are still here. The real estate is still here. Uh, now it becomes what's the new relation? You know, what does gold represent to the world's wealth? It's, I guess that's, I guess that's what I would say. I mean, he, I think he is making some incorrect assumptions in his mind. Yeah. You, you're, 
uh, pointed criticism, if you spoke to him, would be you're probably not taking enough count of the depredations of the fiat currency. That, that's basically what I'm yeah. And, and that may be so, I don't know. He seemed pretty sharp to me, but maybe that's true. Uh, uh, David, I have an interesting question or something. Uh, somebody said the British Empire ran on 150 tons of gold. What was gold valued then? What was the net worth of the British Empire, which is what you're talking about, the net worth of the world, bonds and uh, real estate and equity, <coughs> is that the gold? Well, I don't know. That's a very interesting line of inquiry. I don't know the answer to that question. The stat that it brings to mind, though, when you mentioned that was, and I think I'm remembering this correctly, that at the peak of the terror in 1979-80, when people thought the world was coming to an end and they were buying gold, the value of the gold in the world represented 20% of the wealth of the world. Today, of course, it's less than 1%, I think, of the wealth. Uh, or, or, or between one and two percent, I think, is the total amount of wealth. So uh, now, of course, you know, we, we, we would reasonably expect that the magnitude of that kind of terror would be much greater this time around if the paper dollar stays alive. And so you could see gold, uh, you know, in that equation, you could see gold jumping to 30, 40, 50 percent of the value of the wealth. Uh, so, I mean, there's enormous, uh, obviously, you don't need to show this crap, hang on your gold. <laughs> enormous implications. But uh, I, if I had to hazard a guess at your question, you were saying at the time of, uh, let's say, 1800 or something? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, certainly the wealth of the world increased so dramatically during the 1800s uh, that if I had to make a rough mathematical guess, I would say that even back then, uh, you know, when there was no panic, when there was a, you know, a smoothly functioning, you know, relatively smoothly functioning uh, world economy, gold was probably 10 or 15% of the total wealth of the world then. And that was much less gold, of course, in existence, too. Okay. Uh, I'll take the side of that trade, the guy selling there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the other side. Um, Nathan, excellent. And after, I mean, listening to your presentation, the metaphor occurred to me, which is somewhat analogous to the canary in the gold mine, is that gold, is the gasoline in the banker's house of cards, and backwardation is the trigger mechanism, the ignition. So that's my feeling about your presentation. In a situation where the fear of currency is collapsing in value, you outlined, you could see in your mind a discussion between the lawyers about how to unwind the debt structure. Right. Now, I've often thought about this, and I'm wondering what would happen. And I can only take the side of the lawyers who say, look, the contract says dollars, yeah. I paid you in US dollars, and I think, you know, what used to buy you a big bit of real estate now is lucky to buy you a hamburger, but here's your US dollars, we've paid it off in, you know, we've, we've extinguished our debts. Well, what, what's, how can you reasonably argue the other side? Come well, the other well side. I guess, I guess, I, you know, the, the, the sort of the um, uh, uh, finishing comment I put on that part of the uh, presentation that may be actually true, and the courts may actually say that, but it may be impossible to get your hands on enough U.S. dollars to actually deliver if the banking system itself goes under and has to go into a huge receivership while you know they sort out the derivatives and they sort out you know what depositors should get, and they'll probably end up getting you know in terms of value they'll all probably get up getting uh, you know three cents on the dollar or whatever, but it'll take years to unwind. At that point, the debtors are now in default. And there will have to be a deal struck. I mean, I guess if I had to bet, I would bet that those debt holders will become, they will wipe out the equity holders. And, you know, I, I have to say, in, in fairness, you know, if it were courts of equity instead of the, you know, courts of the, of the you know, the statute to law, uh, I'd say that was the right result because the debtors were supposed to be taking less of a risk than the equity holders in a, in a firm. All right, but under that scenario, US dollars paper money is becoming almost worthless, so it would be easy to acquire on the part of the debtors. They well, if if we go through a hyperinflationary period first, uh, what we're talking about here, and this is what the professor has called the sudden death syndrome. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we don't have a hyperinflationary period, and I think it's less likely. I mean, you know, Zimbabwe is obviously uh, you know living in the same year that we are, but uh, for the developed world, you know, the, there's much more wealth at stake. Communication is instantaneous. Uh, the internet lets everybody in on, you know, maybe not as fast as the trading desk, but they certainly let people in on it that night, you know, after the activity's gone on during the day. I don't think there will be time for an old school uh, hyperinflation to take place. And that's why I say it might be very, very difficult for so the dollar market. Yeah. <laughs> not, not, not that that would drive the dollar value up. <laughs> But uh, yes, it might be difficult to retire debt contracts that way. But I think he's doing his best, he's printing this.
<laughs> Just on that, I mean, I think that we're getting political here. And, and you know, I remember when, when governments put budgets together, what do they do? They get their treasury officials to sit in there and calculate what the effects are going to be on all the different voting classes. And to my mind, the, the game the government's going to be sitting here is going, when well, this is all falling apart, going, well, we've got all these people who have mortgaged up houses. We've got all these people who've got investments in shares. Sometimes they're both of them. They're going to have this big head-scratching exercise to work out who do we screw and who, who the people we screw are the ones who vote for. That's easy. <laughs> Most of those are borrowers. Exactly. And so very few are creditors. Yeah. So, so you just yeah, yeah, yeah. to you, 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 you take the inflationary part exactly. and try to wipe, wear away the real value. Exactly. And that would be my bet. That's, the governments are going to look at the votes as they, you know, I mean, obviously, if, if everyone is sitting on house prices, their house prices are falling and they're all gone negative equity, they're going to be screaming like anything. Yeah. Well, you're, well, right. So, you're, you're right, you're right. You're right. The, the, the easiest thing for the government to do may be to say, well, look, you know, there's no way to sort it out. And if we try, we'll all starve because the economy won't keep running. We're going to just have to wipe out everybody's debts. And of course, you know, the, the president who says that will be very popular. And, you know, the, the wealthy people will, you know, go away and sulk. But the world will carry on. And, you know, I mean, the wealthy will uh, lose a bit of their wealth, but, you know, if they, they own things clear title, they won't be that badly hurt. And, you know, the pain will have to be done. That's probably how it would be resolved politically, I would think. Uh, I, I tend to think that you need to look at this further than that, too, Nathan, because if you just wipe out debts, right, the chances are that any creditors floating around in the world would no longer be giving you any money at all. Well, there's it, consequences to that. I mean, I agree with what uh, Bron said, and there's precedent for it. You just have to look at the GM bankruptcy proceedings, right? That's mm. a, a, an example of screwing creditors. Mm. Um, I agree. And, I agree. I, but my point being is that there's consequences to this. It, it, you know, you've got to ask yourself, and then what? You know, the action of and consequences. Yeah, politicians then, never then, ask that question. <laughs> There will be consequences because if yeah. you just wipe out debt, yeah. and you will screw the creditors, but then the creditors will action something else afterwards, and from that point on, your economy might not get any money. Well, so yeah. right, I, I don't want yeah. to loan you anything. So hard to deliver with them. So you know what I mean? Like, well, it's, it's, oh yes, I, I agree. I, I, I hate to add, I don't think that's the proper equitable solution to it. However. Uh, that would what what you said would certainly you couldn't wipe out debt if you were if you were just going to carry on with a new type of fiat currency. Uh, or if you did return to uh, a gold and silver standard, then now you know the question of loaning becomes very simple because you have to discount houses, you know, with real bills, and now you've got enough credit to finance the commercial goods. You know, we don't need to keep we don't need to build the you know new factories immediately, but we need to keep the food flowing, and that would be enough to get the economy back on its feet and. New, I mean, there'll be people willing to invest longer term. You know, maybe the old creditors won't ever want to do anything uh, like that again. But they'll, you know, there there will business. I don't think it's an oversimplification to say that the world will be able to carry on. You know, we can survive this, uh, even well, if there's I, a lot. Of, I, I agree that we can. But even even if there's a lot of injustice in the. You know, you look at the, the situation in Venezuela where Chavez has gone in and just nationalised all sorts of projects, from oil to gold projects, whatever. What that, what that does is it sends a great big signal out to the rest of the world that if you want to invest in us in anything, this is what's going to happen. So they don't, you know, like they just don't. So that that is potentially what's going to happen if you just get rid of it. The world will go on, but that economy will, will suffer in some way with lack of credit. You know, we're talking about scenarios of moving towards economic rigor, debt. All right. And it's my contention that we might want to look at Japan because of the capitalist economies that have suffered huge deflationary bouts. They're the most vulnerable. And a little known event happened in this last month in Japan's banking system. The Central Bank of Japan told the banks that they now had the wherewithal, the right, to allow their small business borrowers to stop paying on their loans. And they would, and the Bank of Japan would not hold this cessation against the banking system as a liability. They, that they did not have to wipe it off. All right? This is going on right now. 
The Japanese first started playing with their banking system in the 1990s when they had a huge deflationary collapse because of their tremendous bubble that happened. It was the largest one since 1929. All right? What the Japanese government allowed them to do was to just not look at the books, which is essentially what they've done in the United States. Somebody mentioned that Carl Benninger's called Mark to Mark is really basically Mark to Myth. Don't look, don't tell in a financial system. They're going to do whatever they can to hold their little gang, which is huge, together with banning wire, lies, deceit, and whatever else is going to keep it going. I think it's the feeling in this room, there's a limit to everything. There's an even limit to what they're doing. But if, if they're going to allow, I think they, they may do an iteration, they may not. This is, you know, the fact that they've done it in Japan doesn't mean they're going to be in the United States. But that's a very interesting thing when they've allowed, said, okay, you, you, the people can't pay their loans, small businesses can't pay their loans, don't, don't collect it. There's, there's no consequence to them. They don't go into default, and you don't have to declare it as a loss in your books. All right? That is, you know, that's, that's another iteration. An iteration that's being forced by circumstance of a dying system. And, I, you know, I really appreciate what you've done today because, you, would, you know, a lot of us were here last year, and what you did was you just took where we were then and you just looked at the future from where we are now, and we're a year closer to it. And I wonder what we're going to be looking at next year. A little less air in the room. <laughs> Curious me if I can just make a quick uh, how are we for time, uh, Marcus? Uh, uh, just a, just a very that's, that's just a very quick uh, comment. You know, I guess if I were the lawyer for the uh, creditors, or, or I should say for the debtors, trying to convince the creditors that they ought to forgive all the debt, I would say, well, you know, for the for those of you, you know, your losses on the on the debt may be partly or completely or more than completely offset by the growth in the value of your real estate or your other assets you know, by giving the world economy a fresh start, you may end up far better off, you know, by, you know, a measure of, of purchasing power or gold ounce, you know, purchasing power, uh, than if you hung on to those debts and caused economic chaos to continue. That's a very, uh, you know, uh, qualitative argument. I could maybe back it up with a bit of math, but, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I, I don't want it to be seen that I'm championing, championing debt forgiveness because, you know, that's, <laughs> there's, there's plenty of honest people who held those bonds, you know, widows and orphans, etc. Uh, yes? There's a, a primary rule in all of this, though. A debt that can't be paid will not be paid. And wow. right, right now, these debts that all these people have that they don't know, they can't pay them. Yep. Now, you can play like, you can do mark to myth and do all that, but a debt that can't be paid won't be paid. And you're just going to have to factor that in, and the creditors are going to have to factor it in, and they hate it. And the, like the, the unions are owed pension, uh, pension income for the next 50 years. That's a debt to them. It can't be paid, and it won't be paid. Ask these uh, Northwest Airline pilots sitting right here. What happened to your pension plan when it can't be paid? So if it can't be paid, it won't be paid. You can. You know, paint it any way you want, but it's not going to be paid. So you're just going to have to, you know, work around it. Oh, uh, Louis, did you, did you, were you uh, well, on cue there? Very quickly, I, I just don't believe for a minute that there can be um, debt wiped out by by the by the. First of all, it's not the politicians that make decisions; the bankers and uh, the, the the debt needs to carry on because the the money is debt. And uh, if their agenda is to continue with this monetary system, as bad as it is, it's the last thing they'll do is wipe Oh, the yeah, I agree with that statement. If they try and keep their... They're going to have to swallow it. Eventually, a creditor is going... That will be the end of the system when that happens. No, no, it can, it can, it doesn't have to be catastrophic. It can be... No, no, the end of the system doesn't mean catastrophic. It means by the time the banks are willing to wipe the debt off, it's because they're ready with the new monetary system that's going to come. Well, that's okay. But the debt can't be paid. Could this be a little like the situation in Germany after World War II? There was a lot of economic crisis. The debt structure was ruined by everything that was high, the fair bit of inflation around. And chaos got so bad, the German government said we wipe out all, all debts in the previous currency, and 
everyone starts to view the Fichte Deutschmarks as a disnoyer. Yeah, Gerhard, what's his name? Gerhard and Erhard. Yeah. Well, he did that in 48, and that was the basis get in there? for starting. Yeah, complete reset. But the debt got wiped out. Yeah. Yeah, you see, it, it, it helps. I was just going to say, it helps when you have a, a, a benevolent superpower that's uh, helping yeah. rebuild your nation, too. Unfortunately, there's. <laughs> we're, we're on our own. We have to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps for this, uh, for this problem. Yes. Yeah, when you're talking about uh, debt uh, not being repaid, I agree that uh, there's more debt that can be repaid under the current scenario. The, the obvious tool that central banks have to allow that debt to be repaid is, down, is, is devalue their currencies. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I believe we're already starting to see that attempt happening now. Where, um, where where currencies are being we're, we're going into an inflationary period, I believe, generated by the uh, the central banks, by the uh, quantitative easing, and they will keep those pretty presses running <coughs> however hard they need to 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 create inflation, so that the debts become in real terms more manageable. That's my view. But the opposite view of that is what we use to pay is credit, and credit is contracting. Yes. They, they're putting in all this money, but total credit is contracted. So it's a, it's a uh, what do you call it? Uh, a conundrum. Well, I'm just going to make a statement on that. Um, it is contracting in the private sector, in yeah. the real producer consumer economy. Within the government and central bank banking nexus, it is not. Total credit is, is contracting. contracting. It's not just not believe you. Uh, just following up on the German thing, what happened there was they went from a socialist system to a free market system. If they let the people go, just do it, and this crushed Newton down bomb back to the Stone Age country, and people got together and rebuilt it because they were allowed to do it. And it's kind of like the pioneer Americans came in the first two years, Plymouth Rock or wherever it was, they came with socialist ideas, and people starved to death. And by the third year, this isn't working, let them just go, let them get the benefit of their labor. Free market policies came in, and it took off from them. What happened to the Indians, Bill? <laughs> I suppose I should just point, I mean, remember we're talking, I think every country is going to have a different solution to this because there's different political situations. In Australia there is this, this obsessive home ownership, you know, it's the holy grail. Maybe it's, you know, and other countries have different home ownership. It's pretty obsessive in Canada too. Percent, you know, different sort of renting rates versus home ownership rates. So I think there'll be different yeah, you know, there could be well different trade-offs in different areas. I think in our case, there's already this somewhat resentment to banks and should it get that bad, you know, the government will just switch and go, all those evil bankers, you know, blah, 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 and yes, we're going to wipe your debts because those evil bankers shouldn't have lent it to you. I mean, I can see all that sort of crap happening. <laughs> you know, depending on each country may well be different, depending on the bankers have got a bit more of an ear and, yeah, you know, it's not going to be uniform. It'll be, it'll be chaotic. All right, well, I think that, uh, I think that exhausts the so only the kernel oil that, that, that we have invested in mine countries so we wish that to rent. Well, uh, you know, that's a little outside my, my uh, subject, but I'll say just a few words on that. I mean, the, you know, should is, is, you know, like I found out on the first day there, that's, that's a loaded word. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, especially in this audience. You know, the, the, the problem is that a mining business is a business. And, uh, you know, I suspect it's the same in Australia, but in Canada, you know, in North America, it's, it's a very, very difficult business. You know, regardless of uh, what level of production you're at, even if you're at the very, you know, large producer, but especially if you're a smaller one, you've got complications with finding the ore body and making sure that it's developed properly and cost overruns and, you know, environmental issues, uh, you know, native land claims, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, you're trying to maintain a profit margin I mean, I did a very simple analysis of the three largest, for Canadians, the three largest, uh, most widely held gold companies, uh, which was uh, Barrick, Newmont, and Goldcorp. Uh, for five years, uh, I think uh, ending on March 1st, 2008, I was using it in my sales presentations to advisors, and I said, here's the compounded growth rate over five years for these three big companies. You know, they, they, you know, they, in, in a rising gold environment, there was the great time to show how leveraged they were to the price of gold, and uh, the difference in the compounded growth rate, I mean, to be fair, our, our fund was gold, silver, and platinum equally weighted, so I took an equal weight of the improvement of the price of those three metals, 
and equal weight of the improvement in the share price of the three biggest mining companies. Now, of course, dividends are about you know a percent a year or whatever. I didn't include those, but you had barely uh, a one or two percent greater annual return by owning the mining companies at the time when they should have absolutely been shining. Uh, so you're not getting compensated unless you are really, really knowledgeable and are able to, you know, get in and private placements in, you know, the smaller developing mines. And even that's risky, or else everybody would be doing it. It's, it, I would say, it's don't treat it as a sure thing. Treat it as a, as a, uh, uh, you know, uh, the icing on the cake for your physical bullion holdings of gold and silver. Now, of course, I sell gold and silver, but I, you know, my argument I think can stand. The well, was there a significant difference between Barrick and the other two? Uh, Barrick did lag at that time a little bit, but the other two were not. They weren't. It wasn't hugely different. Uh, what was the difference in the hedge book? Because it's widely regarded as how Barrick's fallen on its rear end. Let's sell them down. I don't remember the, uh, the the full detail, but like I said, it was only a simple. You know, I just did the simple return analysis, the compounded return analysis. Uh, I know I'm, I'm you know maybe angering a number of mining stock investors by saying that. <coughs> all, all I would say is just keep in mind that it could work out spectacularly. You know the leverage could come into full play. Uh, you know as long as the government doesn't seize your uh, mining property. Uh, but uh, it, you know I, I just wouldn't treat it as the you know your, your core holding. No, a lot of the reasons for the underperformance of the leverage of the mining companies in that period was because their costs were going up. Well, yes, yes, that's, that's what I'm that saying. It's hard years. to maintain the profit margins because of all that. But in the next few years, you've got a situation where the mining industry as a whole is going into a decline or a real plateau. So mining costs are going down and the gold price is going up. In this situation, we ought to see leverage come back again in order to catch up. Oh, well, you mean, it's right, because there's no shortage of engineers and things yeah, like exactly. that. Exactly. There was a huge yeah. shortage of all mining equipment and personnel in that period, and the costs of hiring a, you know, a first-year geologist out of university and so on just doubled and quadrupled. Well, if, if the I, oil price goes back, back towards the $147 a barrel, I think you'll see that same effect again and start to lose that. Thing. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in how much each factor of production costs a mining company, so I mean, I'll, I'll, I won't make any more comments, you know, except to give a general advice. I think yeah, it's so that's, Let's call a spade a spade. Gold shares are speculative, and gold bullion is an investment, or better yet, a saving. Not quite. No? Uh, no? Well, spade a spade. Sorry, Trevor. <laughs> it's okay. I, I, would, I would say that bullion is not an investment. Yeah. It's, it's insurance policy. Yeah, it's a different form of money. So <laughs> it's, it's the same, same kind of like insurance. I think the professor says that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what I say, too, as when I have the opportunity to, to give advice. But, um, and, and, and shares are a, a, an investment. Some of them will be speculative, but some of them will be pretty sound, good, sound investments in the portfolio. But they are equities. No, that, that's, I think that's what the main difference is. When we talk bullion, it's money. It's not, uh, it's not an investment. You hoard it. Yeah, that's a better way of putting it. You know, the CEO of our company said, you know, I start with the assumption that I should own nothing but gold bullion, and then you convince me why I should move some of it out of cash into an investment, whether it's in a regular stock or a mining stock or anything. Uh, and that's maybe, uh, you know, I think a, you, can, you can arrive at the same conclusions, but if you rethink your own investment policy based on that, you know, you may be happier with what you've already got than, uh, than otherwise if things are unpredictable. Any, any more questions? Yeah, equities, uh, equities will be wiped out if the uh, crisis continues as it has, uh, with the exception of gold equities. Because the gold mining companies, whatever bad things you can say about them, have one uh, great advantage, which is that they can carry their books in gold units, which other companies either are f not foolish not to do, or they just, uh, because of circumstances, couldn't do. And as a consequence, the capital of the companies, with the exception of gold mines, can be destroyed, and uh, they are in the process of being destroyed with, uh, because of the uh, quantitative easing is going to push interest rates lower, etc. So the gold mining equities have a great role to play. Just how well they will play, this is of course open to question, because the management has a very poor record they show a, a, a great deal of stupidity of what they have been doing and how they do. 
So they, I think they will uh, free themselves of the, uh, they are in hock to the bank. Right. But the banks are pretty well gone. So they will get their freedom back. And how they will play their hands remains to be seen. Uh, so if you are selective about gold mining equities, uh, you, you, you may have a good chance to save your investment. I, I wouldn't hold out rubbish, even including oil share, uh, energy. I don't think they are as good as, as gold equities. Do you recommend Barrett, Professor? <laughs> 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 I have proposed a toast to the funeral march. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your attention. And